It's time to check out the mightiest empires of the world that nobody ever talks about, from the bizarre conspiracy of the Tartarian Empire to the dynasty that shattered the Byzantines. The Tartarian Empire The myth of the Tartarian Empire is one of the wildest conspiracy theories out there right now. Before I even start, be sure to remember that there's no clear-cut evidence of a place called Tartaria or a group known as the Tartarian Empire, but I'll let you come to your own conclusions. It all starts with a building. In 1908, the Singer Building in Lower Manhattan rose into the skyline, spanning 27 stories tall. It had vaulted roofing and marble columns. It was the tallest building in the world for about a year, at a whopping height of 612 feet. Then, in the 1960s, the extraordinary building was demolished. And to this day, it's still the tallest building to ever be demolished under peaceful circumstances. But what does this have to do with a mysterious empire? It's because all over the internet, people have come up with the idea that the Singer Building was destroyed by a global force trying to erase the Tartarian Empire. The conspiracy claims that the vast kingdom that spanned the entire globe existed roughly a century ago. This kingdom, the Tartarian Empire, ruled from a capital city called Tartaria, somewhere in Central Asia, possibly Kazakhstan. But when the civilization crumbled due to an unpredictable cataclysm, everything connected to them was erased. All of their great buildings were destroyed, and their history was scrubbed off the face of the planet. And a few surviving examples of Tartarian architecture in other parts of the world were promptly torn down. The Singer Building in Manhattan was just one of them. It's a tough conspiracy to follow, but that's the gist of it in a nutshell. A century ago, the greatest civilization known to humanity was obliterated. Then, some great shadowy power erased them from modern memory. This isn't based on any kind of archaeological evidence. The theory wasn't even created by scientists, but showed up around 2016 on Reddit and YouTube. I need to give a huge thank you to Nancy Seaman for the super thanks and for supporting this channel. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the channel for more videos like these. The Lost City of Titiakos in Spain's Soria province, archaeologists unearthed the remains of a city dating back 2,000 years during recent excavation work. This city, which was previously unknown to us, had been hidden since the 1st century BC, and surprisingly, it was part of an empire that was largely unfamiliar to most people. The ruins are of the Celtiberian city of Titiakos. The Celtiberians settled in the north-central region of Spain around the 3rd century BC. They were composed of a mix of Celtic and Iberian tribes, but not much is known about this empire. They ruled the valleys and countryside between the Tagus and the Iberus rivers. They were part of a vibrant culture, and they were extremely warlike. The Celtiberians loved a good fight, and even went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Roman Republic. The reason not much is known about the Celtiberian Empire is that there are almost no historical records of them. There are few references to their cities and only a handful of mentions of them in ancient texts. The name Titiakos has come up before, but nobody knew if it was a real place or a myth. The only big event historians know that the Celtiberians were a part of was the Sertorian War. The Sertorian War was fought between a group of Roman rebels and the rapidly expanding government in Rome. Between 80 and 72 BC, the Marian faction of Italy fought their last stand to remain relevant. All the various tribes of the Iberian region, who didn't want to give up their home to the Romans, fought together, including the Celtiberians. But after a decade of battle, Roman forces prevailed. The Ashanti Empire the Ashanti Empire was a very real empire that was part of pre-colonial West Africa. In the 17th century in the African nation we now call Ghana, the Ashanti ruled supreme. There was no solidified empire here until Europeans showed up. In the late 1600s, Europeans arrived and things got extremely dangerous for the local chiefdoms. The Ashanti, who were a Kan-speaking people composed of different chiefdoms, wound up getting a huge advantage over the other groups in Ghana. The Portuguese travelers took a particular shine to the Ashanti, making them a significant trading partner. Suddenly, a confederation of chiefdoms who'd been of no great importance was growing wealthy. The Portuguese were bringing them weapons and riches beyond their wildest dreams, and the Ashanti soon became a force to be reckoned with. They had more guns than their rival tribes, and more cash to spend. 
By around 1700, the Ashanti, led by Ose Tutu, established themselves as the most powerful entity along the coast of West Africa, and the city of Kumasi became their capital. Ose Tutu was a particularly wily ruler, and he propelled the African Empire into the modern world. He created a constitution and centralized the military. He also established cultural festivals. Ose Tutu even took a lesson straight from the original dictator's handbook. He appointed himself to be a representative of the Ashanti ancestors. By doing this, Ose Tutu legitimized his rule and was able to form a dynasty. It was just like how the ancient Egyptian pharaohs claimed they were chosen by the gods, allowing their families to rule untouched for centuries. The empire really did flourish into one of the most successful that Africa has seen since the Middle Ages. Unfortunately though, this is where the good part of the story ends and the horror begins. In the 1700s, the Ashanti Empire's wealth came from gold, but by the early 1800s, their economy had switched from gold to slaves. The slave trade was booming, and it was the main source of income for the Ashanti. The British, French and Dutch had a perpetually growing demand for slaves and the Ashanti provided these slaves by being in a constant state of war with their neighbors. The consequences of the slave trade were felt immediately. For 106 years between 1790 and 1896, the Ashanti were responsible for decimating African tribes, kidnapping people, and selling their rivals to Europeans. This not only devastated West Africa, but also weakened the Ashanti because they were constantly at war. They were so weak that when the British Empire showed up, they could hardly fight back. By 1874, the British had captured Kumasi. There were several rebellions, but none of them lasted very long. The British then exiled the royal Ashanti family and made the Ashanti Empire part of their Gold Coast colony in 1902. The Trebizond you know about the Roman Empire and you've likely heard of the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine Empire was also called the Eastern Roman Empire, the offshoot of the Roman Empire that lasted a thousand years after Rome itself fell into ruin. But there was also an offshoot of the Byzantine Empire that lasted for about 250 years, and it was called the Empire of Trebizond. This is a name that doesn't come up very often. Although not many know its history, the Trebizond Empire played a major role in medieval politics. It was the last true surviving descendant of the original Roman Empire. It's mostly famous among historians today for its beautiful princesses, deep pockets, and power at the edge of the Middle Ages. There are about to be a lot of names coming at you, so hold on to your socks. In the year 1185 AD, Byzantine Emperor Andronikos I Komnenos was murdered in Constantinople. His family was hunted like dogs in what some experts have referred to as an orgy of blood. The nobles of Constantinople wanted this family extinct, and the only ones who survived the violence were two small boys, a pair of grandsons of Andronikos. Their names were Alexios and David, and they were both smuggled out of Constantinople. The brothers were then sent to live with Queen Tamar in Georgia. They grew up waiting for a moment to take their empire back in the name of their slaughtered family. In 1204 AD, Constantinople was once again in political turmoil. But more than that, the Byzantine Empire was at an end. The army of the Fourth Crusade was at the gates of the city, and soon enough Constantinople would be ransacked for the first time in its glorious history. The Byzantine Empire was about to be shattered by the Crusaders. With help from Queen Tamar's army, Alexios and David marched into the eastern part of the Byzantine Empire. They captured the port city of Trebizond and the surrounding region. It was the most important port on the Black Sea, so strategically it was a good move. Alexios declared himself the Lord of Trebizond and the Emperor of the Romans, but it was a title that didn't mean much. Trebizond isn't really anywhere near Constantinople. Alexios maintained his control over the region, and his descendants maintained their claim to the throne of Constantinople but they were so far away that their claim was laughable to the other kingdoms. That being said, Trebizond did become a kind of miniature Constantinople. For the next 250 years, it was an isolated empire at the edge of the Black Sea, and the city was ruled by the blood descendants of the last Roman rulers. 
There was a lot of stuff that happened during those 250 years, like civil wars, child emperors, and princess drama. But alas, those are tales for another day. Lemuria Since a time nobody can remember, stories of a fabled sunken continent have been told around the world. The continent is called Lemuria, and it was supposedly submerged somewhere in the Indian Ocean. It was always thought of as a myth until 2013, when scientists found physical evidence of it. Although nobody knows when the story started being told, they definitely became mainstream by the 1800s. Scientists began openly theorizing about a lost continent in the Indian Ocean. They called the people who lived on this continent Lemurians, and they suggested that they may have had four arms and were hermaphrodites. I don't know why the people of this lost continent had to have multiple arms and all the reproductive organs available, but that was what scientists said 200 years ago. The idea might seem silly, but it flourished in every corner of the scientific community. Then, in the 20th century, scientists said that it was ridiculous and denounced Lemuria as nonsense. But they must feel pretty silly now, because it looks like Lemuria was real. There is an actual lost continent in the Indian Ocean. Scientists have identified pieces of granite and zircon that prove that a very big landmass sank into the Indian Ocean 84 million years ago. It may have once connected the island of Madagascar to the southern tip of India, then stretched all the way to Australia. But was it ruled by an empire of lemur-like humans who looked like hermaphrodite versions of Goro from Mortal Kombat? Well, that has yet to be proven. Could there be other lost continents out there that are just waiting to be discovered? Let us know what you think in the comments down below, and while you're at it, subscribe to the channel. The Golden Age of India there have been so many empires in the Indian subcontinent that it would take me hours just to list their names. But there is one empire that stood out more than the others. It was the Gupta Empire, the greatest of all the Indian dynasties. They ushered in the Golden Age of India between 320 and 647 AD. When I say Golden Age, I mean a time of pure prosperity. For the 300-odd years that the Gupta Empire controlled northern India, science and art flourished in a way that had never been seen before. Poetry, drama, mathematics, astronomy – all these things made leaps and bounds forward. This was the most celebrated creative era in ancient Indian history. It was a time when Indian astronomer Aryabhata figured out that the Earth rotates on its axis and measured the solar year at 365 days. The Gupta Empire was also a civilization that was built on stories, folklore, religious lore, genealogies of gods and tales from the Hindu and Jain religions became widespread. Stories became a huge part of life, which undoubtedly helped fuel creativity and scientific endeavors. The issue with being such a progressive civilization was that they were defeated by military incursions. In the 6th century AD, the Gupta Empire was defeated by enemies on all sides, falling into ruin and going extinct. Defeating the Mongols the Majapahit Empire was founded by Raden Wijaya at the end of the 13th century. This Javanese empire, a kingdom that was extremely important yet pretty obscure today, was responsible for defeating one of the greatest Mongol rulers. Prior to the formation of the empire, the Indonesian island of Java was ruled by a different power. The kingdom of Singhasari reigned supreme in 1289 AD. Then came a letter from the dominant civilization in China. Kublai Khan, the descendant of Genghis Khan and ruler of the Yuan dynasty, demanded tribute. But the Singhasari weren't about to give in to the demands of the Mongol leader. The demands were refused, leaving the messenger humiliated. Kublai Khan was furious and sent an expedition to strike fear into the hearts of the Javanese. Things were a little more difficult to accomplish in the 13th century. It would be three years before Kublai Khan's forces arrived on the island of Java, and in those three years, the power dynamic shifted. A rebellion broke out in the kingdom of Singhasari. The royal family was massacred, with the only surviving member being Radha Wijaya. Radhan fled from the usurper, hoping to start his own empire somewhere else, and that was when he bumped into the expedition force sent by the Khan. Radhan told the Mongols all about the rebellion and the new power that had taken over Java, and since they had a common enemy, the Mongols agreed to help Radhan get his family's throne back in exchange for paying tribute to the Khan of Khans. 
What followed was a major military success. In 1293 AD, the Mongols and Radan's rebel forces took back control of the capital city, Kediri. Then, as the Mongols were celebrating their victory, Radan turned against them. He launched a surprise attack and slaughtered the Mongols. The few who survived escaped to their ships and sailed back to China, leaving Radan Wijaya as the sole surviving member of the Singhasari kingdom. He started his own kingdom though, the Majapahit Empire. It would last until 1527 AD, which is a respectable amount of time for any empire to thrive. Which of these ancient empires is your favorite? And which other obscure dynasties do you find fascinating? Tell us in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.